The Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, has a really special title. In the original Hebrew, it, the term Song of Songs, implies the superlative, the best of songs, if you please. It's like we have the King of Kings, or we have the Holy of Holies, which means the most holy place. And so the Song of Songs in Hebrew, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs means the most sublime song. And if Solomon was the one who wrote it, as the superscription seems to indi indicate, it says the Song of Songs, which belonged to Solomon. We know from 1 Kings that Solomon wrote a thousand and five songs. And so this one that we have recorded in scripture is the best the most sublime of all the songs that he wrote. When we look at the Song of Solomon, we have Solomon that's mentioned seven times. There's not much doubt about who he is. He's named by, uh, by name several times in the song, and he's called the king several times. But there's more question about who is the woman in the song. And she goes by the name Shulamit, Hashulamit, the Shulamite. And so scholars have wondered, who is this person, the Shulamite? And there are, there are different theories about this. Some suggest that she is a woman that came from the city of Shulam or Shunam. Uh, others suggest that she was maybe uh, the one that David uh, had as his hot water bottle. Uh, that was, uh, it actually says that she came from the city of Shunem. I don't really find those views persuasive. First of all, because it's not, in the, in the song it doesn't say Shunem, it says Shulam, Shulamite. And this is a play on words with the word Solomon. You have, in Hebrew, Solomon is Shlomo. You hear the SH and you hear the L and you hear the M, Shlomo. And for the woman, it's Shulamit. Again, the SH and the L and the M. And it's the feminine. So for me, the best answer to this is that this word simply means Mrs. Solomon. There's Solomon, Shlomo, and then there's Shulamit, Mrs. Solomon. And this is supported by the fact that this word does not occur until later in the song after the marriage, before this word, this term is not used. And so after she becomes Mrs. Solomon and is married, then they start calling her Shulamit. And then I think there's one final uh, reason why this term is used, and that is that the word Shlomo, Solomon, has as its root idea Shalom, peace. And Shulamit, Mrs. Solomon, is also the woman of peace. And as they are married and they come together in this wonderful, blissful marital union, they find true shalom. Shlomo and Shulamit find shalom. It's the picture that's here hidden in this word Shulamit. The Song of Songs has a wonderful structure. Now, some would disagree with me. Some would say that it's just a collection of random love songs. But the very heading, the superscription, tells us otherwise because it says it is the song of songs which was written by Solomon. And that implies one song written by one author, Solomon. And so I take this song as a unity written by Solomon himself under inspiration of God. And when you start looking at the psalm, you start realizing that the first half of the psalm, of the song, describes their love relationship in terms of friendship, in terms of courtship. They are having times in the country together. They are engaged in their courtship activities, but they're not engaged in sexual intercourse or things that would belong to marriage. And so the first part of the song, the first half of the song, is really about the courtship of, of Solomon and, and his beloved. And then in the middle of the song, we have the story of the wedding. And you have this, uh, in chapter three, this uh, procession coming up from the desert with uh, Solomon and his bride, 
as they're coming up for the wedding in Jerusalem. So the middle section of the song is the, is the wedding procession and then the wedding itself and then uh, actually the very center of the song, the exact center, are these two verses, verse 16 of chapter 4 and chapter 5, verse 1. And on this side of those two verses are 111 lines. And on this side of those two verses are 111 lines. So it comes at the precise center of the song. And here in these two middle verses, the, the woman invites her newly married husband to come and to partake of her garden, of herself. It's a very beautiful and tasteful way of saying she's inviting him to have sexual union with him, to con consummate the marriage in the, in the marriage bed, that marriage night. And he says, I come, I accept your invitation. And then there is this voice that appears that scholars have wondered, who is this voice? Well, I think it's the voice of God himself. He's speaking out of character of any of the other characters in the song. And he says, I give my blessing to this marital union. Eat and drink deeply, O lovers. And so we have the, the first part of the song, which is the courtship. And then in chapter two, actually there's language of covenant. So I think that's the part that's talking about their engagement period and their betrothal. And then in chapter three, it ha it's the wedding procession. And then in chapter four, there is the wedding and then the marriage uh, consummation at the beginning of chapter five. And then the last third of the book is their life of love after they're married. And she has a dream in which things aren't going quite, quite right with their sexual life. And she is kind of apathetic sometimes and he seems to be coming at late hours and there seems to be problems that need to be worked through in their marriage. And so for a couple of chapters in the song, uh, several of the songs, they're working through those marital difficulties as we all have challenges when we first get married. But as you get to the end of the song, they have solved those marital difficulties and you have the last uh, couple of songs, just a beautiful description of again, their countryside visit and their, their love relationship and their romance, which grows brighter and brighter and brighter every day of their lives. And so it is a song that ends uh, happily ever after. And the part that I like most about the song, not only does it have this theme at the middle of the consummation of the marriage where God is giving his blessing upon sexuality, but toward the end of the song, there's another high point. This is in chapter eight in verse six, where, where the woman is speaking of how wonderful love is. And she says, love is stronger than death and love is like a, like a raging fire. And then she goes on to say and that love is actually the flame of Yahweh himself. It is the flame that comes from God. And so she's basically saying the love that we have as, as husband and wife, we can't do it on our own. It's the love that God gives us. And so God gives us the power to have this special kind of love that the Song of Songs describes. And furthermore, if our love is a spark off the old flame, that means that this song is also about God. That this song not only shows us what a good marriage is like, but this song shows us that our marriages typify the relation between God and his people. And so in this song, we, also, we read not only about wonderful, holy sexuality within the marriage relationship, but we find a type, a typological reference to God and his relationship to his people in the church. And so you can read the song on that level as well and find very deep spiritual implications for God wanting to have an intimate relationship with us that is just as intimate as husband and wives know. It's a great song. In fact, that's why Rabbi Akiba said, all the books of the Bible are holy, but the song of songs is the holy of holies. I think he's right. When we talk about the Song of Solomon and we speak of Solomon as the author, the question naturally comes up, 
how can Solomon be the one that's writing about this great subject of love when he had so many wives and concubines, a thousand of them? Certainly, he can't tell us what pure and holy and monogamous faithful love is. Well, that's what I used to think about this book. But the more I looked at the background of Solomon and his beloved, I came to a conclusion that changed my mind. Because when you go to uh, First Kings and you read the first nine chapters of First Kings that tells the story of Solomon's life, you find that shortly after he became king, he married. He married uh, a woman who was an Egyptian in descent, Pharaoh's daughter, in fact. And she was a, a God-fearer. Even though she was from another nation, she was a true believer in God. And when you go to the Song of Songs, you find many allusions to Egypt. And when it's talking about this woman, it talks about her as the daughter of her noble people. It talks about her using allusions to Pharaoh's chariots, many references to Egypt. And so I believe that the most likely candidate for this woman, Shulamit, the Shulamite, was Pharaoh's daughter that he married soon after he became king. And when you read the next few chapters, you find that after he marries her, he starts building the temple, spends seven years building the temple, and then he spends another 13 years building his palace and her palace. And after 20 years, he's finally got all the buildings done, and it mentions again, he brings up his wife, one, to be able to settle in her palace. That means that for the first 20 years of his marriage, he was monogamous. He was faithful. He was faithful to this God-fearing Egyptian woman that he married for love's sake alone. And so as he's writing this song in his youth, he is writing out of a heart that is faithful to his wife. And in the storyline of the song, it's love and happiness and faithfulness forever. Unfortunately, he didn't live up to the storyline of his song. And after he wrote the song in his old age, uh, First Kings tells us that he started loving other women and he started making these political alliances with other nations and would get other women as a result of that. And so he messed up this beautiful plan that he wrote about. But that does not detract from the fact that when he wrote it, he was a faithful God-fearer. He was a faithful monogamist. He was a faithful husband to his one wife. And so I believe that this book is given by inspiration of God to tell us what married love should be. Even though in his later life he didn't live up to that, that does not take away at all the inspiration and the beauty and the holiness and the, and the clarity that this wisest man who ever lived wrote about this most beautiful gift that God gave, the gift of sexuality. I find that the Song of Songs can teach us very special lessons for us today in our practical life, in marriage, in our relationship to sexuality. Uh, the first place, the, the fact that there is an entire book of the Bible, the Song of Songs, that is written to extol the beauty and joy of married sexual love, tells us that God considers sexuality as a very special gift to his people. My wife likes to say that the Song of Songs, we know it's inspired because no human church committee would have ever voted to put it in the canon. <laughs> oh, how can we just have some love song in there? And so for uh, 2,000 years uh, in the Christian church, most of that time, people refused to read it as a love song. They allegorized it. They took away. They unsexed the sublime song and just saw it as some sort of uh, platonic love between God and his people. And they, they reinterpreted all the, the, all the statements. So like uh, the reference to the Shulamit's uh, navel is the cup of salvation that God offers to the church. And her two breasts are the Old and the New Testament. And they allegorized it and took away all of its beauty in terms of its 
relating sexuality to something good. So the first lesson I would learn is that our church needs to hear the message of the Song of Songs for the primary reason that it was written, that God wants us to recover our, our realization that this gift, even though it has been distorted by Satan and there's so many distortions and, and, and perversions, that God in the Song of Songs says, here's what I really intended it to be. And the Song of Songs is actually, many commentaries recognize this, it's actually a commentary on Genesis 1 to 3. Many of the themes, many of the terms are exactly the same as Genesis 1 to 3. It's basically saying, even though the fall took place, God still has a way. He has power. He's the flame of Yahweh. And he can make our marriages like the one that he intended Adam and Eve to have before the fall. So that's my number one lesson. Second lesson is that the Song of Songs is written describing the whole relationship of this, this couple before their marriage and then their marriage and then after their marriage. And right during the wedding in chapter 4, when, when the, the bride is talking and the groom are talking to one another, the groom says of the bride, you are a garden locked. You are a fountain sealed. It's language of virginity. And so the song teaches us that in God's ideal plan, the husband and the wife save each other for each other and save their virginity and save their sexuality for within the marriage and within the bounds of matrimony rather than before. So uh, kids ask, uh, uh, should I have sex before marriage? I take them to the Song of Songs and I say, do you want to have a marriage like this that's filled with romance and joy and ecstasy and thrilling adventure? Then save yourself until the wedding and God will reward you by, uh, by giving you the blessings that, that Solomon and his beloved had. And then a, sense, a, third, a third lesson I would offer is that since this song goes through the whole range of the courtship and then the, the, the engagement and then the wedding and then the life after wedding and living out the details of the problems and then, and then showing finally how great love is, that really this book is like a marriage manual. That we as pastors, we as lay people, we as parents should point to this book and help our, our kids to understand the flow of this book. There's been lots of, uh, of scholars that have actually written uh, books on the Song of Songs and they've labeled them as uh, marriage manuals, as pre-marital counseling books built upon the Song of Songs. So here we have not just human ideas, but we have a divine plan as it's set forth in some detail throughout the whole life of this married couple of what God's ideal would be. So here we have a book that could serve a purpose of being a, a great premarital counseling book for our young people.